All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Real Women Real Estate Podcast, episode 19. Woo! I'm Kimberly. I'm Courtney. I'm Ebony. And we have a special guest today. Of course, all our guests are special. But before I get to that, let me start with the quote of the day. A dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. A plan backed by action makes your dreams come true by Greg Reed. A message. A message. Thanks, Ed, for the quote. That was Courtney's quote. That was Courtney's quote. That's right. Thanks, Courtney. Coming through. I come through. You know, sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> and our guest for today would be Miss Tiffany Ryland, which is a commercial real estate advisor at Arbo Realty Advisors. Say hi, Tiffany. Hey, everyone. How are you doing? So, and before we get into her, let me just give you a little, a little backdrop on Tiffany. Tiffany Ryland is a trailblazer in the commercial real estate industry a former Atlanta Falcons cheerleader, that's where those arms come from, turned real estate maven. Tiffany is passionate about bridging the disparity gap in commercial real estate, as well as encouraging women to get involved, promote it, and claim their seat at the table. Okay. Yes. I love it. So welcome, Tiff. I didn't make the Falcons. I did do Hawks, but it barely made Hawks. <laughs> it counts. Oh, it counts. There you go. I love it. Oh. So, yeah, we just want to get started, and we're really excited to have you on, really excited to talk about this, because this is an area that is just such a mystery to me. We were talking about this online, offline, and I'm just excited to learn more about this industry, and that's commercial real estate. But first and foremost, tell us how you got started in commercial real estate. So, interesting enough, my father has been in real estate for over 38 years, and so naturally, um, as any child would do, I ran from it. Initially, I went off to college in Atlanta and said that this is not for me. And in 2017, well, actually 2016, I ended up getting blindly recruited to work for a commercial real estate firm in Atlanta. And I said, oh, this is really cool. You know, I get to work for a a firm and it didn't dawn on me until I ended up having to move home. My mother got sick. And so I moved home to be a full-time caregiver. And when she passed away, I knew I needed to do something to kind of keep me going. And so that something was go to real estate school. So I went to real estate school. Um, got my license. I I had to quit my job in Atlanta, of course, um, to be a full-time caregiver, but got my license and I just walked in one day and told my dad, I I work for you now. So that's, that is literally the end and the beginning of it. That was it. And he looked at me and was like, okay. (laughs) That's awesome. Did you say you blindly got recruited? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? What do you mean by that? I got called by a recruiter Um, out of the blue and they saw my resume at the time I was working for a recruiting agency which was so funny that's funny Um, I was working for a recruiting agency they found my resume and they said hey we see that you have real estate on your resume of which the real estate that I had on my resume was um, some marketing work I've been working on some contracts with my dad um, over the years so while I wasn't immersed in the industry I was definitely working with him on different assignments and so they said hey we see you have commercial real estate on your background so uh, we have a we have a company that's looking to hire someone who has some experience, and they called me in. I interviewed, and I got the job. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. I love that you were uh, ready, ready for the call when it came in, and that's what we talk about all the time. Just how to be ready and prepared for the situation. So, yeah, kind of talk to us. This is what I'm excited about. Talk to us about the basics of real estate. I can't wait to ask this question. So, we know that so many of us are in residential real estate. We're into flipping. We're into investing. Uh, we want to get into the commercial space, but we just don't know how and where to get started. So, what are the basics? So, the the how do you get started? Uh, one of the things we talked about offline is it's such a hard, it's a barrier of entry to get into the industry. So the, the sales cycles in commercial can be anywhere from two weeks to two years. And so naturally we cannot survive without closing transactions. And so you have to go through the period of building your pipeline and everything else. That barrier of entry, if you don't have six months of, I would say, living expenses saved up, it's going to be very difficult because you're going to be tempted to get a job in commercial real estate is very much so Um, a full-time endeavor. And so I would say the first thing is if you can save as much money as you can, keep your debt low, extremely low, 
you have a car payment, one of the things I was extremely happy about, I had a low car payment. Uh, I moved back home with my dad, so I didn't have any kind of responsibility outside of um, my car payment and just eating. And so if you can keep those expenses low and if you can maintain just a low debt ratio, I mean, I think, I think you can do well in the industry, but you definitely have to be prepared for not being able to close a transaction for, like I said, six to 12 months. And that's, it can be a stretch depending on how aggressive you are, but it's just very difficult to build your pipeline and, and get things going. That can be the same way, though, in, in residential real estate. You know, it can take a while to get that first um, deal. And you spend a lot on marketing. You spend a lot, even in the wholesale and even in the investor space, you can still spend quite a bit on marketing and getting those leads before something actually pops. You know what I mean? And, and get that space. So would you say it's pretty similar in that realm or would you say it's more difficult? So I think with residential, what makes it a little bit different, the way I explain it is when you walk inside of any building, you can look to your left or your right and anybody can be your client because everybody needs a place to stay or they know someone who needs a place to stay. Right. Commercial is totally different. When you walk in a room, you look to your left and your right and these people may not have a desire to own a business. They may not know anyone who owns a business. Um, if they do, they may have somebody who they're already working with that they're committed to working with. Um, and there's, when you're talking about dealing with corporations and dealing with your, your large organizations, your Nikes and all that, it's very difficult to get in those doors. And so typically that's the, that I would say that's the biggest difference is when residential, everyone can be your client or everyone can be a referral in commercial. It takes a little bit more groundwork. Okay. Is there a special license or certification required for commercial real estate? a different designation than like your normal, you know, uh, real estate license? Nope. You get your regular real estate license and then, you know, you take your test and you get it. What I will say is there are some designations after your license that you can get to qualify yourself as an expert in the field. But starting out initially, all you need is a residential license. Hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. I didn't know if there was anything special you needed for that as well. No, you what can is just your get experience? started. What is your experience as a black woman in your space? And why do you think not more black women or more black people period are in the commercial real estate realm? You know, most of the time when we see realtors, we see people who are in the residential side. I don't see a lot of commercial real estate. So how does that play a part with the role that you're in now? So one of the things that I like to say, um, starting out with this question is, um, I'm going to give you all of the, the, the negative part, but after that, the next thing is, okay, but what next? Because we know that there's a lot of negative to it. And if I, it's almost like when, when I tell my niece, hey, you know, if you go out in the water, you can drown, you can do this, you can do that. I don't want to, I don't want to scare her into never trying to go swim. But if I tell you, hey, you can drown, you can do this, you know, a shark can bite you. But if you pay attention, if you do this, if you do that, then you can be successful. You can get out of the water safe. And so I, I'm very cautious on what I say as it relates to women, especially women of color in the industry because I want to make sure that I, uh, I'm not scaring anyone before they get an opportunity to even try. Mm -hmm. And so for a black woman in this space, here's the deal. There's less than 4% of us in the industry, right? Of which, and when I say 4%, 4% of African-American women um, in the industry, of which there's an even smaller amount of us that are doing transactions, of which there's an even smaller amount of us that are in the C-level suite. That's, mm -hmm. just a, that's the statistics, that's the real. Um, there's not a ton of minorities in the industry as a whole. The industry is definitely um, underrepresented very much. I'm seeing some change happen there, but it's highly underrepresented and especially by women of color. I will tell you as a, as a woman of color in the industry, I've not struck, I've not had, um, I've not had the worst experience, but I definitely have had experiences where um, maybe my experience or my intelligence or my professionalism was tried by someone else. And probably because I'm young, probably because, you know, as men, they have more dominant personalities. And I've even been tried by, um, by non-minority women where you call and say, hey, I'm looking for 150,000 square feet. And it's almost laughable to them because they can't believe that someone who's young and, you know, minority is asking for that much square footage. And so I think the biggest thing is if you're, if you're in the industry and you're a woman of color trying to get into the industry, making sure that you go in there, not with a, a cocky or 
uh, an arrogant attitude, but most definitely confident. And it's so important that you that you continue your education and become an expert in the field. That way, anyone who tries to question your ability, you cannot like me all day, every day. But the one thing you will have to do is respect the fact that I know my stuff. So that's awesome. And did you have, is your dad your mentor in knowing your stuff? Because that's big, right? You know, like I said, a lot of people who are in real estate are residential. So how do they even get to know anything in the commercial realm? Yeah, so my dad is, he is my mentor. He started out in residential and he ended up uh, getting a hold of a commercial, I guess you can call it portfolio. At, his, at a residential agency. And after doing that, he just had an itch for commercial. Mm -hmm. And so he went and he looked up the resumes of some of the top commercial in, or industry professionals and he followed what they did. He got their designations. Um, he started going to certain um, classes and investing and traveling across the country just to be in the room with some of these industry experts. And so, you know, he became who he was just by following in the steps of the people that he said, I, I'm, I'm trying to do business on the same level or the same scale as them. And, and I've done the same with him. Um, you know, I follow heavily behind my father. He is definitely a mentor and a role model for me. That's wonderful. I really, I'm sorry. I just wanted to, to say like, that's really awesome that your dad had that self-starting um, trait and that you're taking after him. I think you know, bigger than just commercial real estate or residential real estate. Like that's a trait that you're going to need if you want to be successful in any industry. So that's, that's really awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. No. So I was going to kind of ask about how um, a transaction kind of breaks down, right? So are you in the, like the leasing building space? Or are we talking commercial instance of like, um, apartments or, um, you know, commercial buildings only kind of describe to us what we mean when we say commercial. So commercial real estate, I would say is, and I would say uh, every place but before you sleep, that's not true. Uh, commercial <laughs> is going to be, um, it's going to be your retail shops. It's going to be your office spaces. It's going to be your warehouse, your industrial, your land, uh, multifamily, anything that is five and more. Uh, anything below five is considered residential still. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's a, a clarification that a lot of people, um, they may not understand that part of it. And did I hit them all? Office retail, industrial, land, multifamily, special purpose, your churches. Oh, that, yes. That's all included in, in commercial real estate. And so do you um, guys go out and own these or are you only doing the transaction piece? of matching that that person in need with that piece of real estate so we are we own real estate it's not commercial our job is the transactional side so we help individuals buy sell and lease commercial property across the country we're mm -hmm. headquartered in houston but we have nationwide capabilities that was my next question that is awesome now you are not just houston you are across the nation Mm -hmm. Awesome. So people listening can reach out to you and get help with their commercial real estate. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's pretty cool. I've never thought about the fact that churches uh, would be considered commercial real estate. But yeah, I guess it would, you would need someone to go out and help find, you know, those spaces. Yeah. Huh. It's yeah. Funny. I'm working with churches now and um, churches are probably the funniest clients I have ever had. Uh, I've set in a number of sermons and, and sometimes with churches especially your older churches uh, they want to get their congregations involved because we've been around for however long and we're talking about selling the very place that some of you guys uh, were baptized in and, and christened in and so uh, you'll go and you'll sit in and you'll listen to a service and then you have to talk to the church about selling it and they are just still faced they're just like so tell me again how much you're offering you know for the property and it's like guys you know and, and it's, it's hard and it's difficult to say, but for churches, especially in this time and this day and age, where people are not as dedicated and committed to going to church, you'll start to see a lot more when you drive through, especially underserved, underdeveloped communities where there's a church on every con or corner, you'll see that they are abandoned or, or they're dilapidated and they're kind of going down. And while it's sad, one of the things that, you know, I think is a benefit is if you sell the church, you can take the proceeds and put it into 
some form of other programming in the community. So, I mean, they're a hard group to sell, that's for sure. Yeah, that's a good point though, because it's still property, it's still real estate. So it still is money to it. Man, yeah. wow, that's just like expanding your viewpoint, expanding your mind. Um, that's, that's really awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, that kind of goes back to our other question that we usually ask when we talk about revitalizing our communities and buying back the block, what that looks like for commercial, from a commercial standpoint in commercial real estate. And that's kind of one of the points that you just said, but can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like as far as getting into and buying back the block as far as commercial real estate goes? Yeah. So it's funny you say that. Uh, we, I had a friend who is literally in the city of Houston right now, buying back the block and developing different corners. And I'm so proud of him. His name is Chris Senegal. I mean, he's yeah, really he's doing- Yeah, he's gonna be on soon. Look. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is phenomenal, okay? I have nothing but good things to say about him. Um, but awesome. what I will tell you is your commercial real estate feeds your communities. And so one of the biggest complaints in underserved, underdeveloped communities is that there's not uh, quality work and not quality work life play amenities in these neighborhoods right so there's not a ton of office buildings when you go in there you may see some fast food restaurants or um, you may see nothing i remember driving into an area that we used to service and uh, we were having a session and there were near the nearest starbucks was five miles away mm -hmm. and so it's just like in my head i'm and at the time because you I hadn't been exposed to it i was like five miles I'm used to a Starbucks being every 0.5 miles. And so you don't realize it until it starts to make sense that these neighborhoods are for sure underserved. And from a, from a commercial real estate perspective, one of the things that, that I have to have, the toughest conversation you have to have with a community is why is Kroger's or why is Walmart not moving into this community? And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Third Ward area here in Houston, but HEB actually has. Um, <laughs> I'm from Third Ward. <laughs> Courtney and I both are from, well, yeah. 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 My, our families are from Third Ward. Yes. We're born, we're from Third Ward. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. All right. They have, they have, a, they have an HEB there. And yep. one of the things is from a commercial standpoint, from a company standpoint, and a, and a business standpoint, the community has to be able to support the commercial real estate. And that means that the community's financials have to be able to feed into the livelihood of that business. So if HEB comes here, we have to be able to afford what HEB is offering. And so it's very tough to be able to put certain things like a Starbucks where they're serving $5 coffees in an area where the household income might be $40,000 between three different people. Mm. And so when we say, well, why is Starbucks not here? And, and why is Walmart not here? Sometimes it's because of that. Sometimes you have a situation where um, commercial real estate is vandalized and the LP or the loss prevention is so high, they can't afford to stay. Now, I think that there's always a solution to an issue, so I don't think that that's, that should be the reason why businesses don't move into them, but I'm, what I've heard and what, I've, what I'm hearing from different organizations um, is that we can't afford to be here because the community doesn't support what we're trying to do, either from a financial standpoint and or, hey, we're, we're losing too much in, in products and, and, and services or whatever. We're losing too much product to continue to stay here. Um, so it's really, from a commercial standpoint, it's really hard to get into those communities unless you're dedicated and, and you work something out to where the community is respecting and understands the value that that commercial real estate brings to the community. It's, it's more than a building. It, it provides jobs and opportunities for the people that live there. And That's so yeah, it's, it's a big thing. Like we can't ignore those communities because you don't want um, someone to steal from you. Hell, you know, you go to any other area and they're stealing from Walmart and H-E-B anywhere else. So why can we not do that? And so I'm really proud of H-E-B for just, you know, taking the charge and putting an HEB in those areas. That's yeah. it's also interesting in the sense that for here, I live in, um, intentionally live in Oak Cliff because it's very analogous to Third Ward. And um, sidebar, I just saw that HEB the last time I was in Houston. I was like, oh, because my grandparents live right off uh, North McGregor. So coming up and I was like, oh, I didn't even see it. I mean, I've heard about it. And, seen it um, first sidebar, I just saw that HEB. <laughs> 
<laughs> the, the playback but to see um to see it in person i was like oh wow it makes a huge difference in the neighborhood but on top of that i feel like there's pushback that could come from the black community for one if everyone filled out their census people would know that there's probably more money than just forty thousand dollars in one household i know that might be the average but a lot of times there's other people who are not filling out their census to even know that and two or to know that there's more money there and two, we are the biggest spenders. So they try to pull that we're not going to spend money, but then they just put a Starbucks up in uh, up the street from me a year and a half ago because they're revitalizing the Redbird area. And it is wrapped around the corners just like any other Starbucks. So mm -hmm. we are in the hood, quote unquote, and the Starbucks is around the corner like anybody else. We leave church and the Starbucks line is down the street. Okay. So I know that they say that, but it's so weird. And I was just wondering in the space that you're in, are you able to combat some of that sometimes by like, listen, we are the top spenders and you may say that we only have 40 and people who only have $40,000 $40, in their house, they'll still gonna buy some Starbucks coffee because that's what they want, right? Again, yeah. we're the biggest spenders. So just wondering if you even have, are able in the space to have those conversations to kind of compete for that business. So funny you ask that. So absolutely, we, we spend, a, a little bit of money to go to um, a conference in Vegas every year where they bring together their shopping center company. So you're going to have your McDonald's, your, um, who else is there? Little Caesars Pizza, all of your retailers, your top retailers, your Targets, your um, Kroger's, all of your big retailers are there. And we go there with the intent and, and we used to have a program and we still have it called IMOC, Invest in My Own Community. And that program was pulled together to get people from the community to start investing in the commercial real estate in the community, start bringing those businesses back to feed the people in the community and to feed that community. And so going to that conference, what we would do is we'd have conversations strategically with different retailers to see how can we get you into these underserved communities? Because to your point, there's a lot more money in those communities than what people see. Um, but the other thing is, we're not asking you to come into this community to gentrify it. We're asking you to come into the community to provide the, the quality of life services that these people need. Regardless of how much money they make or don't make, they still have to eat. They still want to do entertainment things. Why is there not a movie theater in these neighborhoods? Why, you know, why are they having to drive five and 10 miles to go and get their groceries? And some of them don't have cars, so they're having to take the bus and lug groceries back to their home. Why are these things not positioned for these underserved and underdeveloped communities. And so we go there specifically for that. I mean, we've had conversations actually with Little Caesars Pizza and they, they I believe they have or had one of their locations in Third Ward and they were telling us some of the issues that they had, but they also told us why they wanted to be there. And so again, you know, for Little Caesars, I, I appreciate them taking the charge for doing that as well. Awesome. I just, you know, just to kind of point out, sorry, about what you said um, about we're not asking you to come into these communities to gentrify it. I think that's so key because a lot of times, you know, when you're driving, you see, oh, they put a Starbucks up. They put, you know, some trendy restaurant that sticks out like a sore thumb. It's a sign that gentrification is coming. The rents are going up. You know, they're about to change the face of the neighborhood. But, you know, it would be great if what you're proposing actually happens on a, on a larger scale to where the, the people who are indigenous to that community get to stay there and enjoy the revitalization of the community without people who don't have anything to do with the history of the community coming in and drive them out. Um, so I feel passionate about gentrification. <laughs> it has to be, a, it's a delicate balance, right? Because um, one thing that as a, as a black community, we can't hold on to, a, we can't hold on to this property and say, no, nobody else can come in if you're not black, you can't come in here. If you're not black owned, you can't come in here. We cannot have that mentality because we're not going to thrive. That's not how the world works, right? Um, so there has to be a delicate balance. And I think, you know, when you guys have Chris on, he's going to touch on it a little bit. But having kind of mixed income in an area, I think that's how you get a community to survive without having to displace every single person that's there. Now, are people going to get displaced in the process? Maybe. Is it a possibility? Yes. But I just don't think that we should come into a community with the thought or the um, idea that we're going to gentrify this entire every, our area and get everybody out. We can't do that. Right. Um, I think it, it, there definitely has to be a delicate balance of it. But, you know, 
when we talk about moving people up or, or rent prices going up because of commercial real estate that's moving in, you got to think about it from a perspective of, uh, are these people, how do they survive after you move them out of a place that they probably own? It's a shack to you, but it's all they own for them. And so, It's really interesting. No, I wouldn't cut you off, but it's really interesting because you think about the Chinatowns and the Japan towns, right? The little Italy's of the world. And you think about those places, but um, you know, we can't, we don't have those. We don't necessarily have those dynamics and those spaces. And it's interesting what you're saying. You're saying we don't need that segregation. And I think it's because we don't own, we don't own anything. So if we were to come in and do that, um, it just, it wouldn't create money <laughs> back to us. Is that, is that kind of where you're going? No. So I think that the reason why I think a delicate balance of of, of other people, other races coming in. And when I say delicate balance, I mean very delicate. Um, because even in your Chinatowns, you still have people of, you know, Latin descent that live within that area. Yeah. Because we need other people to feed our community. Yeah. Right? We just, that the way of the world is, it's not one black area, one white area, one Asian area, one Hispanic area. We, I mean, essentially, there, there may not even be a race after a while because we're all kind of, you know, integrating here. But I think that, we, we don't own, but we have the ability to own. Mm -hmm. And we don't come back when we have that ability and we don't pour into the community the way we should. And I can't tell people what to do with their money, but when I see someone walking around with a $70,000 watch and you know a $150,000 car, I ask myself, what could that have been done in a community to help feed? But you've got to have the passion for that, right? Like if it's not your passion, then I get it. But the, it's not that we can't own, it's that we choose to be flashy and, and everything else instead of coming back into our communities and revitalizing and creating that generational wealth that we need. And I so think, I think that delicate balance helps us get there. I think it's a lack of, and we say this before on, on several other episodes, it's also a lack of education, which is one of the reasons why we did this podcast is to bring more knowledge to the space that we're in because a lot of our people do not know and do not have the knowledge. That's why we want to have people like you on with the commercial real estate and bringing up how we can get, you know, because I always think that why, especially my, my cousin does a lot of business here in Dallas, why would you want to lease your spot and not own your spot? That's one question I want to know is why not try to own your spot? And, and, and especially if you can get pushed out by your landlord, so say, and you got to get a new spot because of that, why are we not trying to own some of this commercial real estate? That way we can't get pushed out. There's a, there's, so there's a, we actually do a session called lease versus buy. And so every company, every business is not going to be in a position to own. Right. 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 Because if the business suffers or if the business goes down, you still have this real estate and you're responsible for the maintenance of this building. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the house. People rent apartments because I don't actually want to cut grass. I don't want to have to worry about uh, when the light bulbs go off. I want to call you when the dishwasher is broke. Yeah. The refrigerator needs to be replaced. And none of those things are my responsibility. I think the same mindset goes into commercial real estate sometimes until you get into a place where it's like, hey, you know what? I'm tired of pouring money into something that I will never own. I think about living in Atlanta for 10 years and spending almost $200,000 for an apartment where um, when my mother passed away, I called them and I said, hey guys, I know it's 30 days out, but I'm not going to be able to remove. My mom just died. And they said, we don't care. You're, you, know, you have to renew your, your lease now. We don't care. You still have to pay this, this amount of money, even though your mom died. And I was like, hey, like, how was I supposed to know? Like, I didn't, they, God didn't send me a message, but that's the same thing. And so we don't own stuff because at some point it's like, all right, well, and then you're nervous, right? I don't know if this is going to do well. I don't know if I want to stay here. I don't know if I want to be here. And so there's a, uh, there's a thought process of trying to figure out, is it even worth me owning my property right now? And if I lease my space, I can pay $1,500 a month and I can spend 50,000 in marketing. Mm -hmm. But if I buy this space, I have to put all 50000 down to purchase it. And so sometimes people reallocate their money. But after a while, as your business starts to grow, you're right. It makes sense to go ahead and say, you know what? We've grown. We're doing this. We're doing that. We have no intentions of leaving this area. Let's go ahead and, and purchase a building or buy a building. But I think it's, a, it's an individual and personal choice. Most of the time, it's just because they don't want the responsibility of a building or maybe they don't have the upfront capital to go in and purchase right out. 
Yeah, but, and I totally get, I get that. I guess I'm also talking about as far as when we're talking about the flashiness and stuff and okay. where we spend our money, it's more so, okay, if you're going to put your money into a watch or you're going to put your money into this car that's not going to give you back anything that's positive, then why would we, positive as in, as in money, uh, why would we not want to consider doing the same thing? Why not put some, you know, like you said, why are we not investing in ourselves and investing in our communities? Or even when I see people who are like, oh, I'm so proud I'm from here, I'm from there, but you live way out on the other side of town instead of investing back in your community. And not saying you have to live there, although I think it would be great if you did, but to say at least if you're going to give back, why are we not giving back to the to the black community, you know. I think we get so excited to uh, live these flashy lives and especially with social media, you know, pumping it up that if you have this and you have that, you're the coolest new thing. Um, I think we forget about the things that really matter. And those are our communities, you know, those are, those are the people who uh, they don't have the ability to do for themselves. And when you get to a place where you can pour back into that community, I think it's your duty and your responsibility to go back and help where you can. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things that um, we wanted to talk to you about is, of course, uh, the current pandemic. We've seen uh, small businesses really get really pummeled uh, as a result of coronavirus. And so you being in the commercial real estate realm, you know, how has that impacted your business? Um, what, what does, how did you pivot with your clients? Um, or were you able to pivot with your clients during the pandemic? Yeah. So it was interesting when the pandemic hit, there was someone on CNBC and he says, if I was in commercial real estate, I would get out right now. And I said, that is crazy because I'm getting more business than I have ever gotten. Awesome. Um, but also, thank you so much. The pivot comes in where, and, and what I'm learning more and more of when, when it's, you know, I hate to get religious, more of God and less of me. When I look to serve instead of receive, God opens up the floodgates for me. And so I sat in the office with Ed and I said, this is insane. And this is like right when they shut everything down. And I said, people are going to lose their space because I'm all commercial in my head. I'm thinking about people's businesses. And um, he said, we sat there and we talked about it and we were just talking about, you know, their leases are going to be, you know, thrown out the window. They're going to get kicked out of their spaces. And we came up with a program called Lease Relief. And so essentially what Lease Relief does is we go in and restructure your commercial lease agreements for you. And we help you not lose your space, right? So we're, we may be able to negotiate three months of abated rent. Maybe we're able to get uh, six months of abated rent. Maybe we're able to get you to where you only have to pay your triple net fees, your taxes, your insurance, your common area maintenance fees, as opposed to the entire thing. Just getting very creative with how we're restructuring these lease agreements because to see you lose your space over something that is out of your control you know, completely mind blowing. And I'll be honest, there's some landlords who said, we don't actually care. Yeah. We, you know, I, I, it's not my business. And I had one lady tell me, it's not my job to be your financial institution. And those people I think will suffer in the long run because you have one or two choices. You can't get blood out of a rock. If they ain't got it, they ain't got it. And you can try all day if you like, but it's just not going to happen. Or you can work with them to get them to stay so that in the long run, they continue to pay you. Some of the people say, hey, we don't even need our rent back. Just take three months and then come back after the fourth and, and start paying us then. Others are saying, we can't give it to you for free, but we can tag on some additional months at the end of your lease agreement. And so there's all kinds of landlords that have been so willing and so gracious. Some of them reached out to their tenants up front. And some people were like, we don't know what to do. And these, you know, you think it's a small business, but when you're talking about, Sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars in rent a month that can wipe anybody out in thirty days. Yeah, so yeah. that that's pretty much how we pivoted during this whole pandemic, and and we also came across um, an SBA program where SBA is paying the first six months of a mortgage for free, no gimmicks, no games, for free, and you are responsible for your seventh payment. So they're encouraging people to go out and buy buildings. Now you have to do it before the twenty seventh result of COVID, they're trying to get more businesses money, um, that kind of thing. But those kind of programs, we've been making sure that we get the word out to those small businesses. 
That is awesome, Tiffany, because this is- I was going to ask about that, about the SBA programs, because they're doing things on the, on the residential side. We talk about the forbearance period and things like that on the residential side, but they're also doing things as far as SBA loans for commercial businesses. So that's really great if you do have that commercial space and that you're developing something to help people get into their, their um, keep their space and stay in there. I think that's crucial right now. And so- and it just comes back to this other point. You know, I had, I had this, this one personal, one story. So we had this one family that started a business and they were able to provide a space where families could come in or share space, lost their space. They increased the rent by about $10,000. This was a vital company for working moms and they were kicked out. There was nothing anybody could do. And since I'm on the residential side, I really wanted to help them reach out, but I, you know, I just didn't have, I don't have the expertise and that knowledge. So that's so great that you have that. And, you know, I want to get the information out there so that we can share it to other people. Absolutely. And that just brings me to that next point. Like if someone does want to get into the real estate um, commercial side of it, what do you, what do you, what advice would you have for them? Um, like, get, a mentor. get a mentor for sure. Um, I would reach out to a company where you see, or not even a company, individual who you see, who you admire, who you think is doing amazing things, um, reach out to them for mentorship. I would also say, like I said before, save your money. Don't go out here buying watches and you got to have a nice car. I remember there was someone who said, you know, I felt like I had to have a, you know, a, a nice car, a nice vehicle so that people knew that I was doing work. And I'm just like, listen, you can have a nice car and be broke. Yep. And, you know, kind of take yourself out of commercial real estate because you have a $1,500 car note that you really couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, save your money, keep your expenses low, get you a mentor, um, educate yourself. I know that everybody's big on Google and I can research it and look it up. No, you need to take formal classes. Don't be afraid to invest in yourself. If it's a $400, you know, mentor or coaching program from a residential, I'm sorry, a commercial agent that you admire and you, and you look up to, don't be afraid to spend $400 to get knowledge. I think that sometimes we forget that there's value in the knowledge that other people have and that value comes at a cost. And for me, um, the, the cost that you're going to pay, the charge that you're going to pay, it's nothing. It's peanuts to what you're going to get when you invest to get knowledge from somebody and not just from people, but from classes, verified classes, not these online, you know, swipe up and, and let me show you the way. Um, anybody who tells you that you're going to make six figures in the first year, I'd run. I run quickly because <laughs> no one can guarantee you that you're going to make six figures. I want you to, I would like for people to look into the people who are going to keep it real, keep it honest and, and give them brutal advice when it comes to being in the real estate realm. So someone like you. Yeah. I was going to ask, you got some courses coming, some, you know, webinars. I'm like, like where's this <laughs> Tiffany's Ryland's re webinar plug? Like you said, where, <laughs> Actually, I am going to be releasing an ebook, but it's it's free. It's complimentary. It's for anybody who's looking to um, get into the industry, kind of answering some of the questions. I've been getting a lot of calls about how do I get in, what do I need to do. So it's literally just a template that just talks about what are some steps, finding a firm, locating a mentor. You know, what are the finances like? Everybody wants to know how much money you make in real estate. I can tell you, I've made one hundred and thirty dollars, and I cried because of how much time I spent. I lie, I'm not. I didn't cry. But I, I do, I take that $130 check as a reminder, don't waste your time. Um, you know, that I, I'm, not, I'm not here to make $130 to spend, you know, two and three months on a, on a transaction. If it's going to be that, we need to, we need to move it forward. But um, yeah, that's, I, I do have an e-course and it talks about some of, some of those things. It's completely free, no charge. But I do think that if you are serious about getting in the industry, you cannot be hesitant about investing in the knowledge that you can get from, from an expert. Well, sign me up. I'm ready for it. I need the class. I definitely want to learn uh, more about the industry because I think it's a space that we could just dominate if we just knew more about it and uh, we knew more about and they look more like us. You yeah. know what I mean? So what inspires you? What has, um, in regards to like books, what have you read that has motivated you? Are you in the books? Are you a book reader? I am a book reader. We're actually, my dad is calling us to put a bookshelf in the back. We have a, a back room. We're calling it the crazy ass idea room. His idea, not mine. Um, <laughs> but we're putting just books back there that we've read that we like. I think the seven habits uh, or the seven habits of highly effective people is really good. Um, 
And some of these are related to commercial real estate. Of course, I can give you, you know, oh, you should read the commercial real estate expert book that I used to carry in my backpack all the time. Um, but some of these books, I think the, the more self-help books are really good because it helps you be more introspective about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So Joyce Myers has a couple of books that I was reading. Um, and you guys caught me on the spot. I wish I would have brought my little book thing. But Joyce Myers has one that I recently finished. Um, I think it's, what is it? Something about the mind. It's one of her more, I'd have to, I'll, I'll have to send it over to you guys. Is it like a battlefield, a battlefield of the mind? Yeah, a battlefield of the mind. Um, phenomenal book. Made me second, I mean, really take me back and say, okay, you know what? It is in your mind. Um, Ebony is our resident book expert. <laughs> so shout I, out to Ebony, how you are always finishing the guest thoughts on the book. So I just had to shout you out real quick. I, no, I appreciate that because I'm like, I know I just finished this book. Um, but no, she's, she's phenomenal. I love her. Think and Grow Rich. Um, my professor, Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, if you have not heard of him, you've got to look him up. He is freaking phenomenal. Um, what else would I recommend? Uh, don't sweat the small stuff, especially in this industry. You cannot sweat the small stuff. You cannot, you have to have thick skin. And so reading that was really good. Um, what else? I've been more into spiritual books. I bought like five of Joyce Meyer's books. Um, that's awesome. I think that's a great list. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. 100%. That, that, puts me, that puts me way behind. That's for and sure. And you're the second person who mentioned Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. I think the yes. other was uh, Mark Jones. Oh, I I told, yes. I've seen him live. If you, you, you said he was your professor. What, what class did he teach for you? Oh, he did my first year seminar. I was in business school at Clark Atlanta University. And uh, it was it was crazy because my dad had seen him speak before and he came down here for a conference. And so when he was my professor, I was like, my dad knows who you are. And it, it, he's just, he's a phenomenal, phenomenal professor. He's a phenomenal speaker. He changes the way you do things. And he is such a motivation. Um, when he comments on my LinkedIn post, I'm immediately like Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. It's almost like Beyonce just commented on your post. That I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. He's amazing. Uh, he did a he did a workshop for us when I was in college, and I'm I tell anybody he's one of those people who just makes you feel like you could just take on the world, like it's awesome. So that's that's really cool that you got a chance to to learn from him in the academic space. Yeah, he calls me Texas Toast. So <laughs> <laughs> come on, nickname. <laughs> that's actually super cute. Yeah. So um. You know, this time has really gone by really fast. Um, <laughs> and you are going to be our in-house commercial real estate expert. I hope you know, just moving <laughs> forward. Don't be surprised if we if we call you like, uh, Tiffany, can you come talk to us about this commercial real estate issue? Um, but we really do appreciate you being on. Can you tell our listeners how you can um, be found on social media or online? Yes, I think I can. Um, so on Instagram, I am Tiffany Ann, T-I-F-F, or I'm sorry, Tiff Ann, T-I-F-F-A-N-N-R-Y-L-A-N-D. That's Tiff Ann Ryland. And then on Facebook, it's just my name, Tiffany Ryland, T-I-F-F-A-N-Y-R-Y-L-A-N-D. Awesome. All right. Thank so you so much, Tiffany. I'm I just, sorry. I, we have this thing that we do and it's super quick and it's, it's just started. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to slight you and not, and not include you in this new thing. And it's three rapid fire questions. <laughs> and I want to know the first thing that comes to your mind. Yes, you are ready for this. You can do this. Let's go. <laughs> first thing is music. So when you are on your way to that listing appointment, that commercial, you know it's brutal. How do you get pumped up? What are you listening to? <laughs> Rapid fire. The baby. <laughs> oh, trapping. <laughs> trapping before you get to the, oh, I like it. I like it. Trapping. Is, <laughs> it's always, it's always necessary. Okay. So what, what movie, if it's on, you're not, you're going to watch it no matter what, no matter how many times you've seen it, you're going to watch it. What a movie? Uh, I don't know. Something scary. Anything scary. Really? That's awesome. Anything scary. 
I can't do scary. I actually I get scared that. and I have nightmares. <laughs> yeah. I love scary. I yeah, it's like I actually like get scared. <laughs> comedy. I have to follow mine up with comedy or turn the lights on. Oh, my <laughs> I just can't make it. I can't make it. Like I've never seen, like, what's the guy, Jordan Pell? Never. <laughs> Could never. I, I sleep <laughs> Peel, man. I don't know. Yeah. So last question, um, bucket list. If you could just do one thing once this COVID is over or one thing that you've always wanted to do, what would it be? I want to lay down with a tiger. Whew. Girl, you've been watching Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> Where did this come from and why? <laughs> I love, I've always been in love with cats. I am literally the cat lady. I walk through the neighborhood and almost every stray cat knows my voice and they will run to me, kid you not. Um, <laughs> I, had, I had my neighbor's cat got another cat pregnant and she brought her kittens. Um, very close to our house. I won't tell myself, but um, <laughs> so yes, um, I, I am in love with cats and I'm, I'm fascinated with big cats. I think that they are such amazing creatures. Wow. That is amazing. Well, that was great, Tiffany. I don't think I've, we're ever going to get anything to top cats and wanting to sleep with a tiger. <laughs> that is amazing. Thank you so much for being on Real Women Real Estate. We really enjoyed having you and we invite you to come back on again whenever you have some time. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. 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 Awesome. That was such a good, uh, a good episode. Oh, we're still live. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. <laughs> I, was I was stopping it as you Do started. It. That's such a good episode. Courtney, you're, you're yeah. dismount.